Now more than ever, Christian memes. I just went outside and let me just say that sun hit different when it's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> you know the situation is bad when your dad is watching the news like this. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck is he doing? Christian spraying this week. Oh, they're elbowing. Oh. They're doing the elbow. Oh. That's... Jehovah's Witnesses knowing you must stay at home. <laughs> Make a church pastors when someone makes fun of their best selling book. <laughs> <laughs> <Can't stop. laughs> someone spent some time on that. I'm sure they That's did a pretty that. good Photoshop job. I'm sure they did. What in the world? <laughs> Nobody. Worship Lever with skinny <laughs> Dude, that's hilarious. <laughs> Somebody saw that picture and immediately thought of that. <laughs> All right. Adds Kanye West to worship playlist. Spotify <laughs> algorithm. <laughs> what do I do with this? <laughs> when someone asks you about your life before Christ, I was holding girls' hands before marriage. <laughs> what? What is that from? Non <laughs> Non-denominational. Pentecostal. Methodist. Bat. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> Pastors after getting no amens all weekend. <laughs> yep. Singer in rehearsal. How many times can we sing the bridge in service? Worship leader. Eight. Eight. Infinity. Oh, infinity. <laughs> Pastor, turn and greet five people. Germs. <laughs> when you didn't raise all the funds for your missions trip. <laughs> It is the final week of the wardrobe theme. And for this final week, you guys voted and overwhelmingly chose bro tanks from my college days. So here's the first one. It has a question on it. Do you have tickets to the gun show? Well, I don't know about this being a gun show, but you can obviously see um, how seldom I actually wear sleeveless t-shirts. So this week we're going to talk about covalent bonds, and in order to understand covalent bonds, I want to give uh, this story here. So imagine we have two sisters or two friends, however you want to view it, uh, Sarah and Emily, and they are both cold. Now the problem is, is that they're both cold, but they have one blanket. So what is the solution to this problem? Well, if you've um, been to kindergarten or anything like that and learned how to do your sharing, what seems natural in this case is that Emily and Sarah will share the blanket. And when they share the blanket, see this now, when they share the blanket, they actually both are warm now. They can both become uh, comfortable, they can both become warm by sharing the one blanket. And so um, last week, we talked about ionic bonds. Ionic bonds involved one atom stealing an electron from another. They didn't share the electrons, but this is actually the reverse situation. So here, instead of one person hogging the blanket and stealing it from the other person, uh, instead what's happening is they're both cold and they decide to share the blanket. So this leads us for this week into covalent bonds. Now covalent bonds are bonds formed between two or more nonmetals. Right? This is important. Last week we talked about how um, ionic bonds are between metals and nonmetals, but here covalent bonds are only formed between two nonmetals. All right? So they're formed between two or more nonmetals when they share valence electrons. They don't steal valence electrons, they don't transfer valence electrons from one place to another, they actually stick together and share the electrons. Now, they do so in such a way that both atoms are full of valence electrons after they form the bond. All right, so um, let's give an example here. So we take hydrogen. Hydrogen has one valence electron. Chlorine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. So you'll notice here that chlorine would really like to have one more valence electron right? It has one open spot, so it wants one more valence electron. Now, the same thing is true of hydrogen, okay? And this is something I need to tell you. 
Okay, hydrogen is a little bit different of an atom. It doesn't need eight valence electrons to be full. Hydrogen only needs two, right? That's this note down here. Hydrogen and helium only need two valence electrons to be considered full. All right, so um, hydrogen uh, wants one more valence electron. Chlorine wants one more valence electron. Well, what should they do? What are they going to do? And here's what'll happen. They will come together and they will form a molecule known as HCl. So chlorine, what chlorine will do is it will share one of its electrons with hydrogen. And hydrogen will also share one of its electrons. All right, so here, Hydrogen now has two valence electrons. And guess what? Chlorine now has eight. So what these two atoms have chosen to do is they have chosen to share a pair of electrons. And when they share this pair of electrons, that is what is called a covalent bond. All right, so now hydrogen, notice this. Hydrogen is now full right? Hydrogen has what it wants because it now has two valence electrons, but chlorine is full as well because it went from having seven valence electrons to eight. Chlorine now has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons. Hydrogen now has two. So you notice here that there is a solution to this problem that doesn't involve stealing. Atoms, as long as they are non-metals, can share electrons in order to um, reach their fullness, all right? Now, um, I want to give a little bit of background about these covalent bonds, because when atoms share valence electrons in covalent bonds, those bonds actually store a ton of energy. All right? They store a ton of energy. So there's energy stored in those covalent bonds. And actually, up here, you'll see a video um, that I'm going to show you that just shows you how powerful those bonds really are. This is a boring old gummy bear. And this is what happens when you drop it into boiling potassium chlorine. Whoa, that was awesome. But we're VAT-19, and this is the world's largest gummy bear. So... Find the five pound gummy bear and hundreds more curiously awesome products at vat19.com. So what you saw in this video is you saw a gummy bear. And remember, gummy bears are pretty much just sugar. Uh, what you saw here is you saw a gummy bear being placed inside of a certain chemical. And what that chemical does is that chemical reacts with the sugar in the gummy bear and that actually breaks the bonds in the sugar and causes that energy to be released. So you had no idea there was so much energy in sugar. And why I like this video is because it shows you really how much energy are in bonds. Like take for example an apple, right? Maybe you've eaten an apple before, I hope you have, um, especially um, in, uh, in these coronavirus times, right? Apple a day will keep the doctor away. Um, but if you eat an apple, what you're gonna do is you're going to be eating a type of sugar known as fructose. And you'll see here that all of these letters are different atoms and the lines in between them are the bonds. And so what happens whenever you eat an apple is your body takes the fructose molecules and it breaks these bonds, right? It breaks these bonds 
between the carbon specifically. And when it breaks those bonds, it releases energy. And that's how your body gives you energy. That's how your food gives you energy. What's taking place here in this case is that your body is taking the food that you eat, breaking apart the covalent bonds in that food, and then that energy that's being released is what gives you fuel. That's what gives your body energy. Now I want you to imagine a slightly different situation than the one I let in with. Imagine we've got Emily and Sarah again. They're both cold. They have one blanket. And so they still decide to share the blanket. But notice something here. Sarah decides to hog the blanket. Right? She decides to um, be a bad friend. And she hogs the blanket. And that actually makes her warmer than Emily. All right? So here's the thing is we can envision a situation, just like with these two, we can envision a situation where they're sharing the blanket, but they're not sharing it equally. But we can also envision a situation where um, two atoms are sharing electrons in a covalent bond, but they're not sharing it equally. Now, this ties in the concept of what's called electronegativity. Electronegativity is a measurement of how closely an atom holds its electrons when it is in a covalent bond. All right, so here's hydrogen. Uh, it has one valence electron. Here is fluorine. And it has seven valence electrons because it's in group 17. Now here's the thing, here's the thing. Um, if an atom holds its electrons very closely that means it has a high electronegativity. All right, so um, here, I, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question. What do you think, which, which of these two atoms do you think will hold its electrons closer? Which one do you think will have a higher electronegativity? And when I ask that question, that's kind of like asking, um, which one do you think wants its electrons more? And based on what you already know, you should know something about the halogens. The halogens are reactive. They're in group 17. They only need, sorry about that, they only need one more electron to be full. And so they really, really want electrons. So it would make sense here for this atom to have a high electronegativity, right? It would make sense for fluorine to really want to hold its electrons close to itself because uh, it does not want to get rid of its electrons. All right, so let's look at something here. Let's look at the case where hydrogen and fluorine would come together and make a covalent bond. So hydrogen would bring its one electron and actually, I'm gonna erase this here. So let's, let's do this. Here's hydrogen, here's fluorine. They're going to come together and make a covalent bond, all right? Now, hydrogen will bring its one valence electron. Fluorine will bring a valence electron and they will both share. So this is a covalent bond because they are both sharing. But notice something here. I've drawn it in such a way that fluorine is actually holding the two electrons closer to it, all right? So that means that fluorine would have a high electronegativity. And I'm sorry, that's a really bad E, but you guys get the idea. Um, fluorine has a very high electronegativity because it holds, when it forms these bonds, it holds the electrons that it shares closer to itself. And so hydrogen, in this case, would have a low electronegativity because it does not hold its electrons close to itself. All right, so that's electronegativity. Now here's the good news for you, okay? The periodic trend for electronegativity is exactly the same as the one for ionization energy. Okay, remember last week we said that the closer an atom is to fluorine, um, the higher ionization energy it has. 
Well, in this case, fluorine also has the highest electronegativity. So that means that the closer you are to fluorine on the periodic table, the higher electronegativity an atom has. So that means that all of these atoms over here, they tend to hold their electrons very closely to themselves. All right, these, at, these metals down here, they have almost no electronegativity. They, they would love to give up their electrons. They, they don't wanna hold them close to them. So in this case, um, the rule is that the closer an atom is to fluorine, the more electronegative it is. And so like, for example, oxygen, oxygen's right here. Oxygen's right next to fluorine. So when oxygen forms H2O with hydrogen, look how close those electrons are. Like hydrogen is, is sharing these electrons right now, right? But look how close they are to oxygen. That's because oxygen has a higher electronegativity. So with all of that being said, let's try a couple of examples. All right, example problem one, which of these pairs of atoms will make a covalent bond? Well, remember that covalent bonds only happen between two nonmetals. All right, so hydrogen and sodium. Well, hydrogen, let me find my cursor here. Here we go. So hydrogen is a nonmetal. Sodium is a metal, so that cannot be the answer. All right, uh, because because uh, covalent bonds only happen between two nonmetals. Uh, magnesium and gold. Well, there's magnesium, and then gold, AU. I hard, and you, you hardly ever have to find it. Um, it's somewhere over here. There it is, AU. These are both metals, so they cannot form a covalent bond. What about carbon and fluorine? Carbon, right here, fluorine right here. Those are both non-metals, so they will form a covalent bond. Okay, all I did was I looked for the pair that had two non-metals. All right, here's another example problem. Um, which atom will hold its electrons farthest away? Which means it has a low electronegativity. Now remember, the highest electronegativity is over here with fluorine. So that means we wanna find the atom that is the farthest away from fluorine, okay? So silicon, bromine, oxygen, boron. Well, it's probably not oxygen because oxygen's right next to fluorine. Probably not boron or silicon either, or sorry, probably not bromine um, or silicon. In this case, it would be boron, okay? So boron would have the lowest electronegativity because it's the farthest away from fluorine, all right? Um, and uh, that means, since it has a low electronegativity, that means that when it forms covalent bonds, uh, it will not hold the electrons very close. That's it for this video. Tune in to the Zoom sessions, finish the year strong, do your assignments, communicate with me. I want to do everything that I can so that you finish this school year strong.